Welcome to Demo Day for the Google Developer Student Club's 2021 Solution Challenge. Over 2,500 students and 820 teams from around the world took on the mission to use Google technology to solve for one of the United Nations 17 Sustainable Development Goals, aiming to end poverty, ensure prosperity, and protect the planet. Over the last couple of months, the top teams received mentorship from Google through training events, code labs, and one-on-one -on -one sessions. Today, at Demo Day, the top 10 finalists are here with us live to demo their projects while judges at Google and UNICEF pick the three grand winners. Months in the making, these students have come together with their local Google Developer Student Club teammates at their universities to create some truly inspiring ideas. Hi everyone, my name is Erica Hansen and I'm the head of the Google Developer Student Club's program. We have an exciting event ahead of us. Here's what's on the agenda. First, we'll hear from a very special guest from the United Nations. Then we'll check out the demos from each of the top 10 Solution Challenge teams, and you'll have the opportunity to ask the teams questions live over Slido and YouTube chat, as well as participate in our trivia break. Some of you may be asking, how do I join the Q&A and trivia? We'll be using Slido to help everyone participate in voting for the People's Choice Award, take part in trivia, and ask the demo team's questions. Scan the QR code you see on the screen to access Slido via your laptop, phone, or tablet device, or add the text code GDSC21 into slido.com. If you're having trouble accessing Slido, feel free to interact in the YouTube live chat as well. As you learn more about each team's solution, be sure to cast your vote for the Solution Challenge People's Choice Award via Slido. We'll announce everyone's favorite team along with the final top three winning teams at the end of Demo Day. Also, there is a developer profile badge we will be sharing, so stick around throughout the event to claim your badge. With that said, let's get things going. I'd like to introduce you all to a very special guest from the United Nations. Hello everyone, my name is Yuping Chan, and I work in the Office of the Secretary General's Envoy for Technology at the United Nations. Every day, I see how digital technologies can be powerful enablers and equalizers to address global issues like education, poverty, and the environment. At the same time, the online space can present serious challenges and dangers, from privacy and digital rights to misinformation and hate speech. What is urgently needed is for us all, international organizations, governments, private sector, and tech companies, civil society, and young people to come together better in this digital age so that we can fully harness the transformative potential of technology while addressing its risks. This is why the United Nations Secretary General has called for a more open, free, and secure digital future for everyone and laid out a roadmap for digital cooperation to achieve this. These 10 finalist projects to be presented today from student groups all over the world in areas such as health, disaster risk, literacy, are a powerful sign of what is truly possible through technology. I particularly love the way they address such simple issues that can have profound impact on people's lives, reaching clean water, helping the visually impaired gain mobility, and creating community through volunteering. But I applaud all of you, not just the finalists, but everyone who has participated in this year's Solution Challenge. I've heard some people quote Albert Einstein when they criticize where we are today, saying that it has become appallingly obvious that our technology has exceeded our humanity. But I think all your work and dedication to helping the United Nations through technology and your willingness to contribute your time and effort to make real changes in the world around you shows otherwise. Much thanks to Google too for being a steadfast partner for the United Nations. We at the UN firmly believe in youth and young people. Digital technology may be the vehicle to the future, but it will be all of you, your humanity and your drive that will get us there. Thanks, Yuping, for joining us and along with the UN supporting the Solution Challenge. We're so inspired by all the work the United Nations does. So next up, let's meet the judges. We have Florina 
and Sammy, Todd, Victor, and Anu. You're going to be meeting each of them throughout the next hour or so. And each of them is, has two different teams that they're going to be sitting down with, asking a couple of questions to get to know the teams. They'll be asking about their inspiration and also a bit more about the technology. So you're going to be hearing more from them throughout the next uh, little bit. Um, so what have the judges been up to? So after the last few weeks, they've really been reviewing the top 10 finalists and evaluating them based on technology and also impact. Um, so we're so excited to have these five amazing judges with us from Google and also UNICEF. And thank you so much to the judges for being a part of the Solution Challenge. Lastly, let's not forget that the students are solving for the United Nations 17 Sustainable Development Goals. That's amazing. These are big and very important goals. And these students took on understanding what the problems are and thinking of ways that they can solve them uh, using technology. So that's so impressive. And in case you're not familiar, these goals include no poverty, zero hunger, good health and well-being, and more. And so you're going to be seeing more about how these students tackled these various uh, goals. So that's enough for me. I, I want to get straight to the demos. So let's kick off those demos. Hi, everyone. I'm so excited to kick off this year's demo with Dementicare, an app built with Flutter and Firebase that's equipped with a wide range of features to complement caregiving for people living with dementia. Let's welcome the creators Aishik and Ritik from Nanyang Technological University in Singapore. Dementia is a widespread disease with over 17 billion hours spent for caring patients in the US alone. What's worse is more than half the carers face substantial emotional, financial, and physical difficulties. Dementicare is a mobile app to complement caregiving for dementia patients. Here, we see the caregiver dashboard with access to emergency contacts, sending urgent notices to any patient using keyboard or microphone input, tracking the live location of any patient using Flutter Maps. We also provide productivity features such as calendars, reminders, and notes for improved efficiency and accessibility. The news section provides all local and international news for dementia. The discussion forum, powered by Reddit, gives access to a large community of carers and patients. The chat room provides a community of caregivers to interact and network with for problem solving. Our health chatbot, which can make appointments for patients, retrieve information on diseases, conduct symptom checking and triaging by using powerful machine learning and natural language processing. and the Profile tab with access to comprehensive real-time information of patients and adding and removal of patients. Now we move to the Patient Dashboard. There's the SOS functionality which can trigger a call as well as send an SMS to the patient's caregiver directly from the app, even where a crash or fall is detected in the background. Play games to help exercise the brain. Family reminiscing with quick access to family members and calling directly from the app. The memory section serves as a scrapbook for the patient to record and store important memories. Notices section displays all urgent notices sent by the caregiver. We have already started collaborating with organizations such as ADA Singapore, Allium Healthcare and Jamia Nursing Home to enable living through caregiving. Thank you. Hi, Team Dementicare. Hi, Florina. It's good to be here with all of you. Hi. 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 I'm good to be here. Awesome. Great. Well, Florina, I'd love it if you could introduce yourself. And I know that you have a couple of questions for the team. Yes. So, my name is Florina Montanescu. I'm an Android Developer Relations Engineer. So, uh, first of all, Team Dementicare, I really, really liked your project. Uh, I think it's such an important topic. And actually, there was one specific thing I liked. Uh, when I checked out the UI, I saw that the, the carers and the patient section in the app are, are quite different. And I like that you paid a specific attention to the UX of the app. So, thank you for that. And now, I have a few questions for you. So, the first one is, what was the feature that was most difficult to implement? Thank you for that, Florina. Uh, the most challenging feature for us to implement would be the different views for the patient and the caregiver, and also maintaining the flow of information from a single application. 
we basically had to strike a balance to keep the app immersive and simplistic for the patient so that we don't confuse them. But at the same time, we had to have it feature rich for the carers to provide the perfect services for them. To give an example, during the early stages of our development, we had made the application in a way that the data flow had to be triggered manually by the patient. This meant that they had to click specific buttons on to send their location and device data and so on. But when organizations and testers tried our application, we realized this would only confuse the patient. Based on this, we re redesigned the entire UI of our app, making it full of visual clues for the patient and automating, uh, automating patient monitoring features into the background. At the same time, we also reconfigured our cloud, which is hosted on Firebase, to ensure scalability for our users. This allowed, for example, a single patient to have multiple carers, which is quite common for family-based carers, or we help shift, shift based carers to register and care for multiple patients. In fact, almost 100% of our testers actively said that this was making their experience much better. So this kind of a flow of information across the patient and the carer while ensuring differentiated views for them was definitely the toughest challenge for us. Well, thank you for the answer. And I really like the fact that you actually listened to the users, that you integrated their feedback in the app. I think that's such a crucial part of building a product. Uh, I have one more question. So um, I remember specifically the SOS functionality. Can you tell me a bit about how it was implemented? Like what technology did you use? And what were the things you had in mind when building this feature? Um, hi, Florina. Uh, maybe I can answer this question. So the SOS functionality on the patient side of the application is uh, a simple yet an essential part of it. So on the front end, we have a large SOS button, which when clicked by the patient will actually trigger a call to the SOS contact. But actually it was also quite important to factor in the cases where the phone or the patient might fall, making it quite difficult to manually click this button. So in such a case, uh, by using the inbuilt inertial measurement unit of the phone, we actually detect the crashes and falls in real time. And this helps trigger a call to the SOS contact of the patient upon such a detection. Oh, I, I see that's cover... a good idea. Yeah, sorry. Indeed. So to also actually cover cases where the SOS contact is unreachable via phone call, we configured the SOS to send an SMS to them at the same time. And this helped highlight the need for attention from their end. And to explain more about the technical aspects of this feature. So when deciding the libraries to implement the call and the crash detection features, we had to take into account several factors like the efficiency of the package, as the SOS had to be triggered in real time, then like the reliability and the uptime, which we gauged based on the popularity and user reviews. And finally, like support for sending an SMS as well. So after research, we decided to use the telephony package uh, to trigger a call to the SOS contact, since it was quite widely used and was recommended by the community for its efficiency and like ease of implementation as well. And it also had support for sending an SMS without opening a dedicated application for the same. And on the other hand, for the crash and fall detection, we use the Shake event plugin, which was again recommended for its ease of use and near real-time detection capabilities. Hope that answers the question. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for the answers. Awesome. Thanks so much for sharing. And we do want to bring in the audience questions. Um, while we're pulling up that question, I do want to remind folks to please go to slido.com and you see the the, um, the code at the bottom there, GDSC21. Ask any questions you have for this team and all the teams that are coming up today. Um, so we'll pull up a question for your team, Dementi Care. And that question is, where do you see Dementi Care going in the future? What are some of the, the next steps and what does the future look like for Dementi Care? Um, sure, uh, thanks for the question. Uh, maybe I can first like go ahead with this. So for the future steps of uh, Dementi Care, uh, both Eshik and I have thought about and classified into two parts, basically the business development and the technical development. Uh, so as we already mentioned, we had already started collaboration with many organizations like Alzheimer's Disease Association in Singapore, uh, Allium Healthcare and Jamia Nursing Home. And our plan for the future is to basically reach out to even more organizations for the professional caregiving services part of our application. However, we had also made the application with the intention to help the non-professional caregivers 
who might not be associated with any organization. So we also plan to make dementia care available to non-professional caregivers like the family members, etc. So we plan to begin outreach to such members of the public as well. Uh, thank you, Ritik, for the business development part. Maybe I can explain more about what we plan to do technically. So as Ritik mentioned, we want to keep improving the applications. We believe in continuous improvement. So we want to add more features and refine the existing features based on market feedback. So some of the things which we plan to do is actually collaborate with organizations to adhere to PDPA guidelines and privacy guidelines because they are pretty stringent in the healthcare sector. And we want to keep it as as usable while uh, as privacy preserving as possible. And another thing which we want to do is actually develop tools for migration and integration of demand care into organizational workflows. So this might include integration with the existing databases or softwares which uh, organizations or people might already have or some other tools which we can develop for the same. Uh, yeah, I think th that's our future plan for now. That sounds great. That's really exciting. And it's great that you already started reaching out to organizations. So great work. And I used to live in Singapore, so I do miss it. It's nice to, to see you all are based there. I hope everything is going well there. Um, but thank you all so much for joining us. And thank you, Florina. It was really great to get to know your project. And thanks so much for uh, being a part of the Solution Challenge. Yep, it's pretty awesome here. Oh, so wow. thank you so much. Thank you. Awesome. Thanks. Bye. Bye. Hey there. Next up, we have the team from Helpier, an Android app that creates volunteering opportunities in local neighborhoods. The app was designed on Figma and developed using React Native and Cloud Run by James, Janice, Muhammad, and Uluwatileyu from the University of Toronto in Canada. Enjoy. Our project Helpier is a mobile app that encourages neighbors helping neighbors through gamified volunteering. 2020 was a challenging year for everybody, especially for volunteering. People are feeling more isolated and in need of help, but may not have anybody in their neighborhood to turn to. Our goal is to encourage a new social norm of volunteering in people's daily routines in their local neighborhoods. Research identified that while over 90% of us want to volunteer, only a quarter of us are actually doing. On Help Your Login screen, first time the user can sign in from an account, which takes them through a streamlined and engage, engaging onboarding process. With Help Your, instead of volunteering from organizations, people can sign up to volunteer to help people in their local neighborhood with flexible time commitments. We, are, we also gamify volunteering and build in our own cryptocurrency called Karma Points, who incentivize volunteering among social circles. On the home screen, users can begin their volunteer task search. By clicking search, the app guides the users through a step-by-step -step process of finding tasks suited to them based on time, commitment, date, and type of tasks. The user can also see all of the closest tasks based on their criteria and switch between map and list view. The user can also see details about each task, such as distance away, time required, and also Karma Coins earned. Here, the user is going to choose to help his neighbor pick up groceries. On the task page, the user can see additional details and also learn more about who they're helping before choosing to volunteer. Users can immediately begin their task after clicking volunteer and confirm once their task is also complete. And since trust and community building is important on help here, user feedback is encouraged after every task. If you are a user that wants to request for help, you can request a volunteer. The app takes you through a similar step-by-step -step process where the user can fill out the details of the request based on location and preview the post before submitting it to the volunteer board. The rewards section allows users to redeem your karma coins and includes a friends leaderboard to incentivize and encourage volunteering in social circles. Here, the user can also redeem the karma coins, our app, cryptocurrency, and can select either a gift card or donate to a charity. The system, the system incentivizes volunteering and also establishes partnerships with local organizations, allowing local businesses to get more visibility within their neighborhood. Help here at, at its core is about neighbors, helping neighbors, and with this platform, we can help build community. Hi, hi again, Florina. Hi, team Help here. It's good to see all of you. Hi. Hi. Awesome. So Florine, I know that you have a couple of questions for this team as well, and maybe you can introduce yourself again. I'll pass it yeah, to you. Yeah. Sure. Thank you. Uh, so I'm Florina Montanescu. I'm an Android developer relations engineer. So um, I really enjoyed checking out your project and learning more about how you see volunteering. So more specifically, one thing I, I really liked is that you're able to give an extra financial incentive for folks to volunteer. And not only that, but because like this, you're supporting local communities. Such, such a good idea. But I have questions. So the first question I have is, are there any 
other competitors or similar apps out there? And what do you think is the main advantage of your app compared to theirs? That's a great question. Um, so in Canada, there are some apps that tailored to specific causes like animal rescues or volunteering for high school students, but there's actually no comprehensive network that really encompasses all the different volunteering organizations or individuals that need help. Um, and this also applies internationally. So myself and James were in Canada, I mean, is in Scotland and Tele's in Nigeria. So we've already seen this type of need of for this kind of platform around the world to really facilitate connection and volunteering. Um, and especially in the past year with COVID, it's really illuminated the desire um, for people to help others in their local neighborhood. Um, right now, many nonprofit organizations don't actually have the funding or even the infrastructure to support their um, own volunteer recruitment program. So the organizations often have to resort to very traditional methods of recruitment like posters or WhatsApp groups to um, recruit people. And so the advantage that Healthier offers as a platform is that um, it really democratizes outreach um, and enables smaller organizations and individuals to seek help from volunteers in their local neighborhood. Um, another benefit is that Helpier really incentivizes social circles to volunteer too. Since we've built in our own cryptocurrency reward system, um, which has like a leaderboard to keep track of volunteering and also sustain interest for volunteers um, after they've joined as well. So ultimately Helpier um, removes the pain point of trying to find volunteers, um, and also allows people to instead to focus on what's really important, which is making a real difference in their communities. And that's the um, main advantage we see for the Healthier platform. Cool, thank you. Thank you for the answer. Um, the second question is a little bit more technical. So I would love to hear what was your biggest challenge when implementing the Android app? And of course, like how did you overcome that challenge? So one, we faced a lot of challenges actually, but the latest one was related to our facial recognition system. Uh, through the, in our last development iteration, when we talked to our mentor, we realized that we need to improve our security to ensure the safety of our users. So what we decided to do is to add a facial recognition system. And what we wanted to do as well is to have like some a strong privacy component. So we wanted to have some on-device machine learning model that would uh, allow us to get that face recognition working. Uh, I'll pass it on to James that will tell you more about how we have it going right now. Uh, yeah, but well, when we were trying to do the facial recognition, um, there were a lot of like uh, libraries available for facial recognition, but it had some issues with like compatibility and efficiency. So we kind of had to build our own backend uh, REST API. Uh, we utilize like facial recognition endpoints uh, when volunteer want to like sign up uh, for a job or volunteering or register an account. Um, it takes like the base 64 image um, data, which is sent to the backend. And that uh, base 64 uh, data uh, that converts to the embedding validates the user recognition and sends the output back to the application. And yeah, that's uh, back to you, I mean. That's awesome. Yeah, thank you. Thanks so much for sharing more uh, about your project. We do have a question from the audience. So I'm going to pull that in right now. Um, so are there any procedures to verify users? Background checks are important in such cases, I believe. Yes, um, this goes back to security. It's one of the main things we thought about with our mentor, about how to verify who is actually using the app. So that's what we, we go back to our facial recognition system. First thing is we want to make sure that the person that signed up is the person that is actually doing the task. And then one thing we're trying to do is keep it localized. Um, the idea is we are not really trying to make you drive two, three hours to some beach cleanup. No, we want you to be in your area. And then, so to that, we're using something of a referral system for people to get onto this app, kind of like Clubhouse. So when organizations come and when people come, they invite people they know, people they can trust. Um, and that way we can build like more of a strong sense of community, especially in our neighborhoods. That's great. Awesome. I would love to use this. I, I always say I want to volunteer and if, if there's something to make it a bit easier or one off, that would be great. So thank you so much for thinking about this, taking this on. Um, I, we really enjoyed this project. So thank you all. Thank, thank you. Bye everyone. Thank you. Wow, I love that demo and excited to introduce the next one.
fee register an app that removes the need for physical paper receipts upon transactions and instead encourages the use of QR codes for users to virtually keep track of all their receipts. QRegister was created with Firebase and Flutter. Welcome the creators, Alkum, Denis, Humeira, and Murat from Middle East Technical University in Turkey. Welcome back to QRegister, the register of the future. Our team consists of curious aspiring engineering students driven to save the planet and improve everyday life with technology. Did you know that the majority of people think that paper receipts are obsolete? According to our survey of hundreds of respondents, most of the users think that paper receipts are ineffective, outdated and hard to keep track of. Moreover, for paper receipt production, masses of trees are cut down, multitudes of water and oil is wasted, excessive amounts of carbon dioxide and solid waste is generated. Keep in mind that these data are for each year in the United States only. Imagine the vast amount of damage paper receipts are causing all around the world. Moreover, 93% of paper receipts are unrecyclable and composed of harmful chemicals which cause diseases including cancer. What if there is a simple solution by using only QR codes? To save our trees, our planet, our home. Introducing QRegister. Our screen is based on Raspberry Pi. It generates QR codes for the purchase according to the inventory files. These QR codes contain all the data in an encrypted form where we use the special hashing system to store data in one string. The QR code is then scanned on our mobile app developed with Flutter which enables us to build our application faster and create a beautiful UI UX design. Q register automatically scans the QR code and asks for confirmation. After the scanning is complete, receipt details will be on the profile page. Listed by dates and labeled with supermarket icons for glancing through quickly, the swipe action archives receipts for easy access. Q register continues functioning successfully in offline mode. We store the encrypted receipt data in the local storage and once you connect to the internet, we transfer it into Firebase. We upgraded by integrating a barcode scanner, which scans items rapidly. We want Q register to be effortlessly implementable globally, so as an alternative, cashiers can also connect a webcam to scan barcodes. In the future, we will use the camera to recognize the items without scanning barcodes. Lastly, we are honored to announce that Q register was selected to be supported by our university. It is anticipated that our first register will be open in our college's merch store and meet users in the summer of 2021. Hi. Hi, Sammy. Hi, Team Key Register. It's good to see you all. We're all over the world right now. This is great. Um, hey, Sammy, do you want to introduce yourself? And I know that you have a couple of questions for the team. I do. Thank you. Hi, everyone. I'm Sammy. I look after Google's Global Accelerator and Experts programs. And I also look after our developer programs in Asia Pacific, uh, and I'm based in Singapore. Uh, I was very interested in this startup. Actually, I founded a startup in this space about 10 years ago. And I have to say, I'm, I'm much more confident about the approach that you're taking, far more scalable with the QR codes. I do have a couple questions uh, for you. The first one uh, that I have is, um, who's your target market over the next two to three years after you complete this pilot uh, on your campus? Uh, and how large is that market? And, and just a, a quick follow-up to that is, uh, what type of technical features do you see yourselves uh, growing into or expanding to be able to get more retailers onto your platform? Uh, so I can take that question. Our aim with Q Register in the beginning was to actually make it widely available so that even a small establishment like a kiosk around your street corner could be able to use it. So we made our um, software so that it was easily implementable, cheap, and fast. That Every establishment that owns a barcode scanner can easily implement QR register by just owning a touch screen. Uh, we also believe that our customers will have an easy time adapting to QR register since we have chosen to use QR codes uh, and QR codes have been really popular and uh, used in the last year due to COVID. So we can say in general that our target in the far future is any person who uses a smartphone or any establishment who uses receipts at any parts of their sales process but for now, our main target will be young adults that are between the ages of 18 and 25 that are actually environmentally conscious. So we, for that reason, we believe that choosing our test area as our campus was a good choice in order to test this strategy. 
podcast and about the technical features, our eventual aim is to be one of the top POS systems in the market. And right now, QRegister solely focuses on receipt information. So adding diversified payment methods is one of our priorities. And secondly, QRegister has automatic inventory control that helps the retailers immensely. This is a unique feature as the usual checkout systems are not in touch with the inventory. This will ease the workload of the retailers. And thirdly, uh, we are thinking about implementing an object detection instead of scanning barcodes for faster checkout because faster checkout equals a better shopping experience and happier customers. And also we have some hashing systems uh, to provide a secure uh, purchase at Q register. And lastly, we will have some form of gamification system, which will be a coupon reward system so that the customers will prefer the system and the application and the retailer more often, and they will return to the retailer to receive their rewards so that the small businesses will excel much easily with Q register. Thank you. Thank you both so much. Uh, that makes a lot of sense. Uh, my next question uh, has a little bit to do with, uh, you know, the integrity of your database. Now, uh, you mentioned that this can function, your system can function even when it goes offline. And I was just wondering, uh, is there any impact on how the transactions are going to be accounted for, uh, particularly on the retailer side, if there's a loss of connection? Okay, so thank you for the question. So before jumping into data integrity, I would like to say that our project is consists of two main parts. The first one is the mobile application that is for the customer's uh, usage. And the second one is the Raspberry Pi and the touch screen that we use for the retailers. So as we mentioned in the question, we added an offline mode for people who have problems with their internet connection during the shopping. For data integrity, we know that the retailer side has a stable internet connection. So while we are generating receipts and converting them into QR codes, we actually send our data to, the, to our servers, to uh, cloud, and especially we use uh, Firebase Firestore. Therefore, loss of connectivity on the consumer side does not constitute a problem on the retailer's part. Also, uh, about the data integrity uh, on the mobile application of ours, uh, although we display all the information uh, about the receipts, uh, we store only the necessary receipt information in the local storage, uh, like a receipt ID, because as Dennis already mentioned before, at that time, only the register sites, uh, on the register side, the receipt has already been uploaded to Firebase Firestore. Afterwards, we just match the receipt with the user when they're back online. Our only request from our customers is that just do not delete the app before going back online because that is like the electronic equivalent of throwing a receipt away. Uh, yet, even if that happens, the retailers are in no way affected because their data is automatically just backed up anyway. Great, thank you. Thanks. Uh, and now we're going to pull in an audience question. Um, so Dan has a question. Why use Q register instead of the email receipts most merchants currently offer? Uh, we can say that people nowadays are using uh, mobile phones quite often and not everyone uses emails. And Q registers initial aim was to actually make it that everyone could be able to use it and at any time. For example, if you go to a market, you can't really ask them to give you an email receipt and that would not be really practical at any moment. But if you have uh, it in your mobile phone, you can just scan it and have it uh, seen right away. And it also has the advantage of being able to work offline uh, so that even if you do not have an internet connection, you can just scan it and it will come to your mobile app. I also want to add on to that because QRegister not only uh, works as a receipt system, it also gives you a way to organize and uh, help you with your purchases. For example, uh, when you are using email receipts, most of them get lost behind your usual day-to-day -day receipts. And we want to uh, put a stop on that. And we keep all your receipts uh, organized in our application so that you can quickly search through all of your market, um, 
inventory searches, all of them are stored in our uh, application. So it's much easier to find what you are looking for. And we also offer some uh, machine learning al uh, algorithms in the future so that uh, customers will uh, be able to analyze their spending habits too. Nice. That's great. Yeah, thank you. Thanks so much. And Sammy, did you have any final final comments? Oh, I, I, I love this idea. Uh, you know, honestly, bring Q register to Singapore. I'll be the first one to sign up. Uh, the one bit of advice uh, that I recommend is, is keep in mind both sides of uh, the, the users you have on your platform, right? You've got your consumers and you've got your retailers and you want to make sure that they, they're both engaged, whether it's a you know, loyalty program or insights on their consumer uh, behavior uh, so that as you continue to flesh out your, your products and the different features, uh, they'll, they'll stay loyal and, and be retained. But congrats on all the progress so far. Very exciting. Yeah, great work. Thanks so much for being here. Bye, everyone. Thank you for having Bye. us. Thank Bye. you. Welcome the team from eOwl, a virtual education platform that helps professors create virtual meeting, exam, and posts. With eOwl, students can also check their grades and assignment online. eOwl was created using Firebase, Google Cloud Platform, and TensorFlow by Ahmed, Keolos, Khaled, and Mahmoud from Future Academy in Egypt. People expect to get bored by e-learning. Our mission is to show them. It doesn't have to be like that. We would love to introduce e In 2020, around 1.7 billion students were impacted by the coronavirus outbreak. Schools are closed and the students moved to online learning. But problems arose and one of them is the lack of interaction and engagement between the instructor and the student. An unproductive learning environment arises when the instructor is unable to observe each student. In our solution, we provide a real-time focus and emotion detection to all students in the virtual meeting. The instructor can create a meeting from the dashboard. When students join, the system will start detecting the focus and emotion of each student. And based on this data, we will start recommending hints or decisions to the instructor or even warn him about a problem in the class. All these hints aim to increase engagement during the meeting. After the end of each meeting, the instructor can see a full analyzed report about all his meetings or a specific class meeting. The report includes the average of emotion and focus and some hints. Providing a new way of helping instructors in the meeting is what we focus on. It's well known that assessing student progress with a low percentage of cheating is critical to a successful education. Provide a new way of managing progress where the instructor can create an MCQ quiz and the students can join but with their camera open. For continuous detection during all quiz time while adding other restrictions such as detecting type changes and other. If the student violates the rules the quiz will be ended and we will inform the instructor of violation.
Hey, hi, Sammy. Hi, Team EL. Hello. Hi, good to see you. Cool. Awesome. Well, I'll let Sammy introduce himself again. And I know he has a couple questions for you. So let's get straight to it. Thanks, Erica. Hi, everyone. It's Sammy here again. Uh, I lead Google's Global Accelerator and Experts programs. I also look after our developer programs in Asia Pacific, uh, and I'm based in Singapore. I was very excited about your project. And I have to say, you know, I, I love the concept of flagging emotional states during, you know, classroom, uh, class time, you know, in real time, and then being able to give these individual um, reports uh, to the teachers. Uh, I do have a couple questions. The first one is related to that facial expression or facial emotion recognition. Um, what were some of the biggest challenges that you faced using that technology in the context of a classroom? And uh, what have you done to overcome or are you working on uh, to overcome those challenges? Okay, thank you for your question. Uh, it's known that engagement and the feeling of a student play a significant role in their academic process. In face-to-face -face education, the instructor can see all the students' reaction, and if there is unfocused student or negative reaction, the instructor can easily determine whether or not to slow down or speed up or in some other way modify his presentation. But the situation is much different and harder for an instructor in online education to get the reaction and the emotion. Does it affect uh, learning process and all the efforts that the instructor made in preparing and teaching become ineffective? Uh, one of our challenges was finding an appreciate uh, data set was really challenging for us. Uh, when we started looking uh, at the image uh, with, which was published uh, in, uh, online, uh, it was even harder for a human to tell whether uh, to tell uh, the image is sad or nature. So we decided to move uh, with, with the one published online, but it's not big enough. So we decided to do some machine learning techniques such as uh, data augmentation. Also, one of the biggest challenges is that human emotions are very individual and latent in nature. Uh, not all human, uh, not all emotions can be translated and decoded exactly. This seems to be also challenging for us, and we plan to do more research with experts to identify more on how we can overcome this challenge in the future. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. That makes a lot of sense. Um, I did notice that that you'd started testing with students to see to get their feedback on the platform uh, what's your plan to get more feedback from teachers yes we successfully tested our project with teacher this this test covered create meeting report and quiz creation and all other feature then start receiving the feedback from the instructor one of them was there is a delay in showing <clears throat> dashboard data but in general they like the idea that there, there is an assistant for them virtually help in managing the class and determine which student involved more and which one is doing great for our next steps, there is this, for our next steps, there is still much room for technical improvement in the project, especially in meeting function, where we are deciding to improve the accuracy and adding more hints and make it more easier with the students with disabilities to interact with meeting and quiz. Beside all that, we are planning to contact a secondary school to try our project with its students. Thank you. Very exciting. Back to you, Erica. That's great. Yeah, we have an audience question. And while we pull that up, I just sort of want to remind everyone who's watching live right now with us, uh, you can ask um, this team, EL, a question and all the other teams' questions as well. So go to slido.com and enter in that code GDSC21. So let's pull up the question. So the question is, what is the benefit to the student who is enabling their camera? Many students might feel uncomfortable with doing so for a variety of reasons. Um, so we wanted to learn a little bit more about what you thought about that. At our last test, we found that some student is feeling uncomfortable with opening the camera to all the meeting time. Uh, so we are deciding to uh, uh, Talking to more with more experts to get to know how to solve this problem in the future. Uh, this 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 program will benefit them, uh, providing them a unique e-learning experience uh, that was not found before uh, for them 
uh, instructors can get uh, all all in, uh, all data and the all emotions that they need and that they to uh, create a successful e-learning environment. Great, thank you. It's great that you're getting user feedback. That's super important. Um, so thanks for that. And Sammy, did you have any final thoughts or comments? Absolutely. Actually, you know, it's a relief that you're you're thinking about, you know, the cultural biases and the individual, um, you know, aspects of emotion and and how we we express that facially. And so I, I'm really happy that you already have that in mind. That would have been, you know, one of my biggest concerns, I suppose, uh, regarding this is making sure that we're, the teachers are making a fair assessment uh, of the students. So I'm glad that's top of mind for you. Um, you know, part of me is, you know, it's very thankful that this technology didn't exist when I was uh, in class uh, so that the teachers wouldn't have a full analysis of, of my face throughout a, a whole day. But, you know, to be honest, I, I, I'm pretty excited about something like this happening, given the, the state of the world right now, given that, you know, online is enabling so much more education. So I just wish you all, you know, lots of lots of luck and congrats on all the progress and and keep building out those great features. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. It was great meeting with you. It was fun learning more about your project. Thanks, everyone. Bye. And thank you, Sammy. Bye. Thank Bye. you. Bye. Bye. These demos are so great. I'm back to now introduce the next team from Project Island Response and Intervention for Systematic Evacuation, or IRISE a disaster risk management system that aims to bridge the information gap between local government units, disaster risk management offices, and the island communities of Tobigo and Bohol. iRISE consists of a web app and a mobile app built with Flutter, Cloud Function, Cloud Firestore, and Firebase. Let's welcome the creators Gian, Jorian, Patricia, and Rex from the University of the Philippines. <laughs> <laughs> Said by Aling Maria, a local vendor from Ubay Island in an interview conducted by a team of student developers from the University of the Philippines. She is one of many residents of the island communities in Bohol who experience severe coastal flooding but resist fully relocating due to fear of losing identity, social capital, and livelihood. Therefore, we introduce Project I Rise a digital disaster risk reduction management platform aiming to contribute to the UN SDGs 11 and 13. And powered by Google Technologies, iRISE banners four core functionalities. And these functions are carried by three technical components of the system, our fabricated tide gauge, web application, and mobile application. Before high tides or extreme weather conditions, on the web app browser, the system automatically warns the local authorities and allows them to disseminate advisory simultaneously. The web application also features a climate change education curriculum to convince future generations to relocate. On the other hand, during extreme conditions, through the mobile app, the residents can also send rescue request notifications and the authorities can also trigger evacuation instructions with one button. Instant Information Cascading quality and accurate information, and unlimited reach. These are the core target impacts of iRISE to the island communities, as it carries on the vision of a resilient Philippines, where all Filipinos are inclusive of growth and are able to adapt to the adverse effects of climate change. This is Project iRISE, and we rise to the challenge. Hi everyone, hi Todd, it's good to see you all. I like your shirts, can we can we take a closer look at your shirts? Matching shirts, nice, I like it, that's great. <laughs> hi Todd, do you wanna introduce yourself? I know you have a couple questions for the team. Hi, I do, um, I'm Todd Kerpelman. I am a developer relations engineer on the Firebase team um, and I am jealous because I do not have a matching team shirt, but uh, we'll, we'll work on that. Um, so hello, Team iRise. Thank you so much for joining us uh, today. Um, I really like this app. This app, this whole program seems like it could have a really uh, significant impact on on people's lives. I'm sort of assuming uh, flooding has become a more um, a more severe problem in in the last few years, and this seems like this could really 
really help people. But um, uh, why don't you tell me about it? What was sort of the story behind this project? And um, wh what made you decide this was an app that needed to be made? Yeah, thank you, Todd. Um, the idea and inspiration of Project iRISE came up from a research study from the University of Tokyo. Uh, the article is about the island communities of Tubigon preferring local measures to relocation in response to the flooding. Therefore, from the recommendations of the authors, our initial step was to understand the status of disaster risk reduction management here in the Philippines and put ourselves in the shoes of the island communities. Additionally, Rex here is a native of Bohol, so this project is especially close to his heart. Right, Rex? Uh, yes, Gian. It is a common pain point uh, that the Philippines in general annually experience the strongest typhoons and natural disasters. Considering climate change, our situation will not get any better. So when our team first convened, all showed the interest to confront the challenges of uh, building disaster resilience in our country. Subsequently, our team also visited the flooded islands of Tubigon and the sad plight of the residents have greatly inspired us as we build Project iRISE. Can you kindly share to everyone, Pat, our observations and findings? Sure, Rex. From our surveys and meetings with the local government units, we found out that there is no existing evacuation system in place. People are using inaccurate calendars to monitor tide levels, and they only use megaphones to disseminate advisories. At this point, we realize that there is an apparent need for these islands to have an early warning system like ours. And this is the purpose of Project iRISE. It was highlighted under the human security pillar of the recently released Bohol Climate Emergency Response Roadmap. Additionally, iRISE can be used not only in natural disasters, but also in local emergencies. So in summary, our inspiration came from previous research studies visiting actual flooded islands and recalling our experience in natural disasters. All of this instigated our team's vision for the project, a resilient and inclusive Philippines where Filipinos across the archipelago can participate in an effective disaster risk management system. And with uh, Google Technologies, we implement the project IRS. That's That's great. Uh, so you say you've been working um, with some of the local uh, governments. What what's sort of their reaction um, been, and who are you sort of looking to work with moving forward? Yes, Todd. We actually had several in-person and online meeting consultations and collaborations with various Philippine national agencies, as well as the local government unit of Tubigon and the community itself, along with academic institutions. They all have been very supportive and amazed how the youth Students in particular take our active part for climate action. Gian, if you may add more and elaborate on our collaborations and consultations. Yeah, sure, but in every aspect of our project development, we have made ourselves open for learning from experts. Apart from the local government unit that help us in conducting our surveys, interviews, and focus group discussions with the islanders, we also reach out to the Philippine Department of Environment and Natural Resources and colleges from the University of the Philippines. They are instrumental to help us define the problem we are solving. On the other hand, NAMRIA, the Philippine National Mapping Agency, was consulted on ideating our solution. These collaborations with government institutions are necessary since the goal of our project is to transfer IRI system to them. Do you have something else, Pat? Yes, I actually do, Gian. So for the implementation in the next months, we're aiming for telecommunication companies in the country to help us get our own localized emergency number. We also have a recent collaboration with the applicants of Bohol as UNESCO Geopark, since IRISE and Bohol Geopark are complementary projects. For everyone's knowledge, Bohol Island is being moved forward to be Philippines' first UNESCO Global Geopark. So Eric and Todd, in hindsight, Project iRISE is a multi-stakeholder project uh, aimed to be a life-saving platform. In fact, through our consultations and actual survey feedback from the islanders, we have determined the best, uh, best practices that we can adapt to. Uh, throughout this course of project, we have learned beyond our, our expectations and we would like to acknowledge everyone who, uh, who has contributed to where we are right now. A special shout out to our project advisor, Almi, 
and to our Google mentor also, Gonzalo. A special thanks to both of you. Thank you. That's great. Wow, thanks so much. Uh, it's, it's been really fun listening to more about your inspiration and everything that you've done, reaching out to organizations. You've already done so much. Um, so I do want to bring in the audience now. There is uh, there are multiple questions, but let's pull in one from Ananya. Thank you for asking this. Um, there are unstable connections at the time of disaster. So how will someone use the app during the disaster? She wants to know. Yeah, so in hindsight, since we know that internet could become unstable at times. So during disasters, there is a text messaging system wherein the islanders could text the rescuers, the local government units, and, and also as well, the local government units can send to the islanders for notifications and announcement. As for the back end, Jay, would you like to add some more? Yeah, actually we are utilizing the Twilio to have this uh, app running are running for as a prototype for for the project IRI. So we use that uh, interconnected with our project IRI via REST API. So whenever someone texted uh, to our localized number, the Twilio account will post, uh, let, let's say, connect, uh, contact our project, and then our system will uh, process this, those data and disseminate all those informations to LGUs and other uh, uh, authorized parties. Thanks. Awesome. Thank you. Well, that's great. And yeah. Todd, did you have any final kind of feedback or thoughts? Um, I mean, this seems like, you know, a, in some ways I'm, I'm sad that an app like this has to exist, but I'm really glad it does and that people are working on a solution like this. Um, and uh, so I say good luck in um, sort of expanding this out to uh, the rest of uh, the community. And uh, I uh, hope at one point to get a t-shirt. Just kidding. Just <laughs> kidding. Too. It's okay. Uh, thank you very much for, for uh, coming on today. And uh, I appreciate all the work you've done. Great work. Thank you so much. It was thank great you. meeting with all of you. Bye, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Hi, everyone. Now let's welcome the team from Flu, a mobile app that helps users easily find clean water sources using Google Maps. Flu was built with Firebase. Flutter, Google Cloud Platform, and Google Maps Platform. Welcome the creators, Aluze, Chi, Metembe, and Nuikwe from University of Bermenda in Cameroon. Due to the uncertainty of knowing if a water source is flowing, my team and I decided to come up with a mobile app called Flow. Flow is a community app built with Flutter, which helps students easily locate the water sources around them. The application displays water sources around a user's location using Google Maps, along with a brief description and the approximate distance. There is also a Get Directions feature provided by the Google Directions API that helps a user locate a water source even if they do not know the location. On the map, the green points indicate locations with available water supply while the red indicates otherwise. Users can save their favorite water sources using the like button and delete when needed. All this information is stored in a Firebase backend and made available to the public through the app. The aim of the application is to save the time spent by users randomly searching for water.
Hi, hi again, Todd. Hello. Hi, Hello. Good to see you all. Awesome. So I'll let Todd introduce himself and then he has a couple questions for you. All right. Well, hi, everybody. I'm Todd Kerpelman. I am a uh, developer relations engineer on the Firebase team, um, at which I know you used a little bit for Flow. So I appreciate that. Um, so what I, what I really like about Flow is I feel like um, you've kind of really taken this challenge to heart. Um, you know, this is obviously access to clean water is very important. And I feel like you're really addressing um, a critical a critical need in people's lives. Um, but I want to hear a little from you, sort of the, the story behind um, this app. What made you sort of decide to build it in, in the first place? OK, so Flow came as a result of the water shortage um, in our community. So in our community, Due to this water shortage, water supply is actually being cut off from the homes of um, students. So, due to this cut of water supply, the water is now being rationed such that um, they could channel water supply to this area at a particular time. Then, after they cut off the water supply and channel it to another area, and this um, rationing is kind of at random, so people do not know when exactly water supply is available in their homes. And also in our community, there are public areas where people can go get water from. But this rationing also affects the public areas where they could go get the water from. So students do not really know when exactly they could actually, like students do not know where water is located because, because they don't know whether even if they go to that area, they will actually be water supply in that area. So this now forces them now to move around with buckets looking for water. So think about this as a student. You'll probably be worried. You can wake up in the morning and you will want to go to school, but now you are worried about moving about looking for water instead of going to school. So flow comes in now to save the time spent randomly searching for water because there are two problems here. Firstly, the student might not know where to get water from. And secondly, they don't know that they don't know whether they will find water where they are going to since the rationing is kind of happening at random. And on average, it takes about 30 minutes for a student to find um, a water source. But with the flow application, it, it, it saves, it limits the time now to about one minute. It takes less than one, one minute for a student to actually find water. So flow comes in to save the water spent randomly searching for water and also helps students searching, search for water. Thank you. Thank you. So wow. So basically, you don't have to. People don't have to guess anymore which community water supplies are going to have water available, which aren't. They'll be able to look at the app. They'll be able to see it, and they'll be able to make updates as the status changes. Yeah, that's great. Um, I I want to hear a little more about sort of the um, technology behind it, particularly the sort of the the geo queries. Um, how are you sort of performing these queries as to um, sort of what water sources are available in your area? And is this something that would be able to scale to sort of large numbers of users? OK. Um, OK. Um, <laughs> continue. OK, so there are about 48 universities nationwide here in Cameroon. And most of these universities, students found in those universities face the same problem that we face here. And so we plan on establishing subgroups in each of these universities so that they could help us gather data and we could upload that data to our fire store, which is going to interact with our Google Maps and indicate all the points. The data which is being gathered uh, is actually the geo points, the coordinates of each of the water sources. That's great. So basically, yeah. you're, you're grouping by university? Yes, yes uh, that's well, right. And uh, also, right now, our querying process is rather simple. We just query the entire database from Cloud Firestore. And that's because the points don't just hold the, the coordinates. They also hold information about the area, so such as a description, the ID, whether it is flowing or not, and all of that stuff. So since we're in a relatively small area now, querying the entire database and running the app processes such as distance calculations and getting the directions is not, not a tedious process. But 
for but when we scale up we'll have to because we cannot query and ent the entire database for locations that are not remotely close to you mm -hmm. so we'll probably set up like sub databases where we can based on your current location query the appropriate database for you and we run all the tasks with using the google maps api the directions api and the flutter location package that sounds like a good plan do you have any other future plans for this app um yes we do um, so right now apart from just expanding we want to make everybody increase certainty so we are we would implement a feature where you can like vote or say that this source is flowing after you have visited so that it can help others know whether this place is flowing or not to to make the app up to date and we're also working on features such as a feature that can calculate all the distances and suggest the tab that is flowing and is closest to you automatically without you having to stress about it that sounds great that sounds like that Thank sounds you. like yeah. a really yeah could be a really useful feature um erica do we have yeah. questions from the audience yeah i think um we we might not have time actually oh. but um but yeah that's okay like definitely take a look at the chat and um and ask us well actually we have the question here so maybe real quick if you have a quick response to how the water is validated and what parameters were used so there are water sources back here in Bambili that have higher probabilities of flowing as compared to others so since we're actually unable to get hardware like sensors that will give us 100% accuracy, we're able now to get the probability that the water is flowing in this particular location. Because there are places back in Bambi where we have constant water and there are places where we, we do not have constant water. But people are not aware of those places where there is constant water or not. Great. Well, thanks so much. It was great learning more about your project. Thank you, Todd. Any final thoughts, Todd? Um, I wish you the best of luck. This is, like I said, I think this is a really um, good project in terms of sort of addressing, really um, looking at sort of the goals of uh, this entire, you know, this entire project and um, really kind of addressing a need that's out there. So I appreciate all the work you're doing. Thank you so much. Yeah, thanks so much. And, and next up, we do thank have you. trivia. So I hope everyone sticks around for trivia. Um, but thank you so much, Team Flow and Todd. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Thanks, Erica. See you. Welcome back, everyone. Hopefully, you've enjoyed the demos thus far. I am Kyle Paul. I'm the North America Regional Lead for the Developer Ecosystem Team here at Google. Up next, we have some more great demos. But first, I've put together a fun little trivia break for all of you. I've collected fun little bits from Google history to some interesting facts about all of our products. So hopefully, all of you are geared up and ready to go for this. How to join? Uh, hop on over to slido.com, and this is where you'll enter the code hash GDSC21 if you haven't joined us already. 
Uh, or you could use the QR code, uh, which should be up on your screen here in a minute, which uh, you can use your mobile device to scan the QR code and join the quiz there. From the quiz, uh, when, you're, when you're joining Slido, you'll see uh, an option with a little blue dot that's Q&A trivia. When you join the Q&A trivia, uh, it'll make sure you're on the polls tab. You'll see your name. Uh, if you're joining with your name, that's great. Uh, if you don't feel like typing in your name, you can go ahead and put anonymous in there. But basically, that'll just help me announce who the winner is at the end of the at the end of the quiz. Through this, um, remember that not only the correct answer gets you more points, but the quickest to the correct answer gets you more points as well. So make sure that once you know the the answer to the question, go ahead and punch that in. And with that, uh, we're going to go ahead and check to see how many folks we have in there. And it looks like we have a decent amount, so we're gonna go ahead and get started. And awesome. So the first question is, what year was Google officially founded? So is it 1995, 1998, 2002, or 2003? You have about 15 seconds left. So make sure to lock in those answers. I see a lot of interesting answers coming in thus far. So make sure to lock in that answer. Uh, we have under 10 seconds left. Make sure to lock in your answers if you haven't already. Five seconds. Oh, and the results are up. Let's see where everybody guessed. Looked like most of you thought 1998. We have a few of you thinking 1995. Let's see what the correct answer is here. And it is 1998, so congratulations to all of you who guessed that one. Awesome. On to the next question. This is a Google Chrome question. So in which year was the first version of Google Chrome released? Was it 1999, 2004, 2008, or 2014? This is a trick question, so make sure you're an you, you have your thinking caps on and you're remembering this correctly. We have about 10 seconds left. So this is the first version of Google Chrome. Let's see, we've got about three seconds left. Make sure your answers are locked in. And let's see what everybody guessed. Ooh, interesting. So we have most folks think 2008. And you would be correct. Great job, everyone. So that was actually when the first version of Google Chrome was released. Up next, we have an Android question. So which of the following is not an attribute of Android widget dot text view? Is it Android ID, Android text, Android layout width, or Android hint? So which one is not an attribute? We have about 15 seconds left for this. Make sure to lock in your answers. And we've got about five seconds left. If you haven't guessed yet, make sure to lock that in. And time's up. Let's see how we went. Oh, wow. Looks like I stumped quite a few of you there. This actually Android hint is the not an attribute of the Android widget text view. So great job, everyone who, who got that one. Next up, we have a, there goes, a TensorFlow question. So in a neural network, which of the following strategies is used to deal with overfitting in TensorFlow? Is it dropout? regularization, batch normalization, or is it D, all the above? You have about uh, 10 seconds left here. Let's see who gets this one. We, ha we have some interesting answers uh, coming in already. So uh, I, I don't think this one stumped many of you. <laughs> Time's up here. Let's see how we went. Ah, D, all the above. It kind of took the cake here. And all of you would be... Correct. So 71% uh, so of you got the correct answer there. So great job. And then up next, we have, oops, let me go back one. There we go. So which of the following network protocols or tools that protect apps from DDoS attacks? Is it Google Cloud Defender, Google Cloud Destroyer, Google Cloud Shield, or is it Google Cloud Armor? So those of you who have been using our Google Cloud as part of your projects, 
if you knew this existed. Uh, we have about five seconds left to go. Make sure to lock in your answers here. Is it Defender, Destroyer, Shield, or Armor? Let's see who got it right. So our results are in. Looks like most of you guessed Google Cloud Shield. And it's actually Google Cloud Armor. So 20% of you got the correct answer there. So great job, everyone. That was another fun trick question there for you. And up next, we have a Firebase question. So what library gives you a pre-built UI on top of Firebase authentication? Is this Firebase UI, Anchor UI, Google Sign-In, or Auth UI? We have about 15 seconds left. So make sure to go ahead and lock in your answers here. Is it Firebase UI, Anchor UI, Google Sign-In, or Auth UI? Five seconds left. Make sure to lock in those answers. And time is up. Let's see how we went. Majority of you guessed Firebase UI. We do have quite a few here guessing Auth UI. Let's see who got the correct answer here. And it is Firebase UI. So great job, everyone, on that one. And up next is our final question for the trivia section today. And there it goes. Uh, so it's a Flutter question. So in the Navigator 2.0 API, it adds what new class to the framework that defines app-specific behavior and how the router learns about changes in the app state? Is it router viceroy, router delegate, router member, or router agent? It's another fun trick question here for you. So router viceroy, delegate, member, or agent? We have about five seconds left. Awesome. And cool. So we get to see, oh, we have quite a bit of answers here trending, but it is actually router delegate. Looks like I, I tricked quite a few of you here. So awesome. Great job, everyone. We're going to tally up the leaderboard real quick. And it looks like Murk, Murk Tan, congratulations. Great job on that. You guessed you had seven out of seven and uh, took the took the least amount of time answering all the questions correctly. So great job there. And it looks like our hardest question was the Google Cloud question around uh, one of our services that protects, protects against DDoS attacks. Great job, everyone. But don't fret, all of you are a winner. So we do have a Google Developers Badge that you can all claim uh, for your google.dev profile just for attending here today. So you can go ahead and claim your demo day attendee badge if you follow the link here. We'll also drop it in the chat. It's bit.ly slash demo day dash dev badge. Go ahead and uh, claim that now. And it'll add it to your .dev profile where you can also take more code labs and learn a lot more about our developer technologies over there with that profile. And lastly, don't forget, go ahead and vote for your favorite team if you haven't already. You can always change your answer later. Go back over to Slido, but make sure that you're on the People's Choice Award section, the one with the red dot. So in there, that's where you can vote for your favorite team that you've seen here today uh, for Demo Day. And with that, on to the next demo, and I'll catch you all next time. Thanks for joining. Next up, we have the team from Game Your Feet, an app that keeps track of your movements in real time using your smartphone's movement sensors. One of the app's game mode cardio camera uses Google's MLKit AI library to detect movements that the user makes. The app is written in Kotlin and is connected to a Firebase project and was developed by Eric, Jason Jeremy, Jason Christian, and Munich from Binus University International in Indonesia. Welcome. Experience the joy in exercising. Game your fit. Do you ever feel like your body has been sitting around all day for the past year? Two-thirds of Indonesians haven't been actively exercising, and Game Your Fit is here to help. Pick a level. Secure the arm strap around your left arm. Go to GameYourFit.com using another device. Enter the room code, and you're all set and ready to play. With our application, you can burn 150 calories in under 15 minutes.
That's 60% of the recommended calorie burn by exercising. It can improve your mood, productivity, and of course, your health. We hear you. Calibrating your phone will help improve the quality of the sensors. Want to work out with just one device? Try out our brand new camera game mode for cardio exercises. Two simple steps. Just set up your phone and have fun. Through the use of various Google services, Game Your Fit aims to motivate you to get active again. Your phone will track your movements using its advanced sensors and lets you progress through the levels. WebRTC is used to connect and to communicate between the phone application with the browser game at GameYourFit.com. The camera game uses Google's MLKit real-time pose detection to detect steps and every single movement your body makes to interact with the game. No more accessories needed. Start your journey now. Make sure to push yourself daily and keep your streak going. Download Game Your Fit now. Hi. Hi, Anu. Hi, Team Game Your Fit. It's so good to see all of you dialing in all the way from Indonesia. That's great. Thanks for staying up late with us. Um, hi, Anu. Do you want to introduce yourself? And I know that you have a couple questions for the team. My name is Anu Srivastava, and I work in developer relations for Google Cloud. I specifically, which is why. I'm so excited to talk to the next two teams. Um, so we get to help people learn our APIs and products so they can use these tools to solve challenges. So should we dive into the questions? Um, so Game Your Fit, I know that you went through a couple iterations of this application. What um, inspires you to start and how did your app progress? All right, so I personally love doing sports, basketball to be specific. Uh, but we all know that because of COVID, sports are now super limited. I myself don't really go out to the gym anymore because I'm just simply scared of COVID, just like everyone else, I guess. Uh, we realized that this is a huge problem for everyone health-wise because people are just sitting around at home and not moving enough. That's why we really want to make something that is easy to use and motivates people to move and be active. Yeah, I actually, uh, uh, I would also like to add that uh, we actually had several ideas but all of them revolves around making people do something at their home. Because, well, if you, in this trying times of ours, uh, it's kind of hard to do anything. Um, but we ended up with, uh, well, gamifying workouts, basically. Yeah, we sort of played around with onboard sensors for the first submission, where users can just attach their phones to their left arm, and it will act as a controller to let them progress through all the levels. Basically, you move, you beat the enemy, and that's the first version. Uh, but if I remember correctly, I think after the first submission, we got feedback from our mentor, Imatia, yeah, that it could be a hassle to use two devices. So we decided to add a new game mode called Cardio Camera to allow users to just use their phone to work out. And this game mode uses image recognition and AI. Yep, that's right. That's our final product. It has both game modes so that users can pick what the what they want depending on the situation and there you go that's the final version of the game your fit app for now at least that's awesome wow. um that's incredible <laughs> um so what were the challenges actually of working with multiple pieces of hardware and and how was it actually using machine learning on devices uh, so at first, we tried to connect the browser and the phone directly using network sockets, which is possible when the two devices are connected to the same Wi-Fi connection. Uh, however, raw TCP and UDP sockets are still an experimental feature in most browsers, and they straight up does not work in others. Uh, yeah, uh, that, and we were also concerned with um, even if we do manage to get it working, we're afraid there will be latency issues, there will be bugs. Um, so imagine doing a push-up and then the game responds half a second second later. Um, that would kind of feel bad uh, in a game. So we decided to use WebRTC since it's more, it's faster, it's more flexible, and we can connect devices even when they're on uh, different networks. 
And for the AI and the second phase of solution challenge, we developed cardio camera as a previously that implements machine learning on mobile. Using the help of Google's MLKit post detection, we are able to use the phone's front facing camera to capture live video of the user and transform it into something like a stickman like figure that we can use to detect positions of each limb moving. And with that, we can detect jogging, the touching of certain regions on the screen and many, many more. Users are able to interact with things which appears on the phone screen. Something like a makeshift augmented reality, you might say. And the model itself was quite easy to set up from Google. Yeah, so for future plans, we're currently in the works on the device calibration for the sensors. Some have found it to be either either too sensitive or not sensitive enough when doing certain exercises. And trying to standardize that when there are so many different phone models can be quite challenging. So per user calibration is our solution for that. But the details for that are still in progress. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you. We, we do have a question from the audience. I'm going to pull that up right now. While I pull that up, I just want to remind people to vote for the People's Choice Award. If this is your favorite team, please do vote now. So just remember to go to slido.com and vote for your favorite team. So let's take the audience question. How much time does it take to train the capture data and then process uh, to scores of the game? Uh... So at uh, the first iteration, we actually have to train the, the detectors. Uh, so we have to take a lot of data. So we took data when we are workouting and putting our phones, uh, strapping our phones to our left arm. And we took a lot of data and we tried to process it manually at first. And we tried to set a high threshold and a low threshold. So for example, uh, when a person is doing push-ups, uh, it can be detected more easily and uh, it works for a lot of people. I think Jason Jeremy can elaborate more on that. Yeah, so we're still using some uh, threshold data that we have from before, but after this, we're, we're still working on that in on device calibration for the exercises. So the calibration feature actually uh, helps everyone from all sizes and all heights to be able to play in our game. So they just have to do a simple calibration workout before doing any real campaign workouts and the system will automatically adjust to their custom sizes. Awesome, thank you. And thanks to the audience for asking questions. Um, and yeah, it was great learning more about your project. I would love to use it. I definitely need to be working out a lot more and I do need help. So thank you for even thinking about this. Um, Anu, do you have any final thoughts or comments? Absolutely, yeah, I can't wait to try it out. Um, this was super cool and I really love that you gamified it to um, help people get excited about working out and the research that you did into um, the needs of exercise also very impressive. So I would love to um, see how you continue to experiment with machine learning and hardware and see where it goes. Yeah, that would be great. And Anu and I both live in New York City. So we yeah. can meet up and, and we'll definitely use this project. Let's go outside but... to the park. <laughs> exactly. I like that. Nice. Great. Well, it was so nice meeting you. Um, Game Your Fit team, great work on this project. And once again, to the audience, if this is your favorite team, please vote now for the People's Choice Award. Um, thanks so much and have a good night's sleep. Hope you get some rest tonight. Thanks for joining. Bye everyone. I'm so impressed by each of these demos. And now we have the team from Eye of God, an app featuring an easy to use navigation system that helps people with visual impairment navigate to their destinations by themselves without needing the assistance of others. The app is built with Firebase, Flutter, Google Cloud Platform, TensorFlow, and more by Anish, Gayatri, Jatin, and Priyanka from the KG Somaya College of Engineering in India. Welcome team. I go with someone else. I, I generally don't go 
on my own to new places. Eye of God is an easy to use navigation system built for visually impaired people to help them navigate to the destination safely. Hey Siri, open Eye of God. Welcome to Eye of God. Please choose a navigation mode. Start outdoor navigation. Take me to Santa Cruz. As the car approaches, the system alerts the user via voice feedback along with vibrations on the side of the belt. The belt comprises of four vibration motors and the motor corresponding to the region where the obstacle lies vibrates according to the distance from the user given by the depth map. Head north towards Central Library Road. Motorcycle. Car. All systems run completely on device, which eliminates the need of internet or cloud-based systems for processing and reduces latency dramatically. Turn left onto Central Library Road. On a turn, the system provides voice as well as pulsating haptic feedback through the leftmost or the rightmost motor depending upon the turn to inform the user the correct direction to turn to. The obstacle avoidance system does not provide voice feedback for relatively less dangerous obstacles. The lack of voice feedback and increased intensity of the motors depicts the same. Take me to Nike. Taking you to your destination. Indoor navigation offers text detection along with obstacle avoidance to guide the user to their labeled destination. If the label is detected in the frame, a pulsating vibration will be produced while a constant vibration will be produced on detection of other obstacles in the frame to avoid collision. You have reached your destination. This is, uh, this is great. Hi, it's so good to be here with all of you. Great project. Hi, Hi Anu. Um, awesome. Well, Hi. this is a great project. Thanks so much for being a part of the Solution Challenge. I really enjoyed Eye of God. Um, Anu, I know you have a couple questions for the team. And also, if you want to introduce yourself again. Yes. Hi, everyone. My name is Anu Srivastava. I work in developer relations at Google for our cloud artificial intelligence and machine learning team. So we get to teach people how to use these APIs and services so you can integrate uh, machine learning into the applications or services that you're building so you can better solve your problem, which is the whole point of Solutions Challenge. So I'm so excited to, to get to talk to you. Um, this is truly an inspirational solution. What inspires you to tackle this and uh, how did you get started? Um, so it was really difficult for us to pick a cause and objective for this project. We all deliberated and spent time on picking a truly unique and globally resonating topic. Our inclination towards the specially able population grew during our brainstorming session, where we were discussing on one of my dad's project, which is called Drishti, which means vision, where they had taken up a challenge on developing a prototype uh, for reusable lenses, which are affordable to commoners, enabling a wider reach. We reached on a consensus that all are thinking about the abled ones, but what about the ones who are differently abled? So we thought of doing a deep dive session and agreed to collect viable data to form up a cause. The data which we got shocked us. India has nearly 40 million people who are blind or visually impaired against a global figure of 285 million. And in a country like ours, where there's a massive flow of traffic in every part, navigating busy urban landscapes can get extremely challenging. So seeing the plight of our visually impaired stranded on the roadside without receiving adequate attention from people and fueled by our desires to build something that benefits the people of our society, we came up with our solution, Eye of God. So we started off by breaking down our idea into smaller chunks, majorly being navigation and obstacle avoidance. The navigation part was relatively easier due to the existence of Google Maps API, but the real research went into the obstacle avoidance. So we pulled up our resources to think of more efficient ways of giving the user feedback of the surrounding obstacles. And that's how we laid the foundation of our project. Wow. Um, so speaking of, you know, integrating these services into hardware, um, tell us more about the process of actually working with the hardware and what were some of the challenges that you uh, encountered? So uh, unlike the other systems in this domain, ours takes only two inputs, that being the camera image for obstacle avoidance and location for turn by turn navigation. So we used a single device that is the user's smartphone for capturing the image, processing it, 
uh, providing uh, control signals to the haptic feedback and to access the gyroscope for navigation and turning. Uh, the directional vibrational feedback was provided to the user with the help of four vibration motors connected to the ESP32, which are mounted on the waist belt. The smartphone provided control signals to the ESP32 via Bluetooth Low Energy. So that was all the hardware that we used. Uh, moving on to the challenges, the acquisition of hardware component, component was quite challenging during these unprecedented times. Moreover, assembling the circuitry was also very difficult as we weren't able to access any PCB manufacturing or fabrication services. During stage one, we used a cloud backend with Flask for image processing, but we were facing a lot of latency issues giving us around only two to three FPS. This led us to explore and switch on to uh, the on-device implementation of the same, where we were able to achieve around 15 FPS. Lastly, running multiple TF-like models simultaneously bottleneck the CPU. And this left us with very little breathing space to incorporate certain features into our solution, such as detecting zebra crossings and guiding the user to walk along a straight path. These were the most significant challenges that we faced. Great, thank you. Thanks so much for, for sharing. And we, we do wanna bring in an audience question. Um, so let's pull that in now. So thanks to Sean for asking, how did you test your app in the real world? So because of the pandemic, we tested the solution on ourselves, which is basically like testing the worst case scenario as we aren't trained to walk without vision. So one of the team members wore the headset as well as um, this belt uh, which allowed us to test the solution. So the second team member was, keep, was keeping a watch on the first one uh, to ensure his safety. And the tester um, um, deliberately ran into obstacles to test our solution and uh, check the user's uh, input and output. So this gave us some interesting results. Um, and we shared them with our user study participant, who is a developer at Google itself. So he shared that uh, one of our features, which is approaching vehicle detection, isn't as useful in the real world as according to him, uh, his safety depends on the sense of the driver as well as his responsibility. Um, that's why we had to scrape out um, that feature from our project. So testing gave us a really good insight of our project and helped us iron out a few bugs and features here and there. That's great. And thank you for showing that to us. That's, that's really amazing. Awesome. So yeah, Anu, did you have any other final comments or questions? Well, I just want to say, again, this is truly inspiring. And something that in particular I really liked about your solution is that you're committed to making this a um, affordable apparatus for anyone to acquire. So I think that's really admirable and you're able to accomplish so much with the hardware and the services that you did use. Yeah, great job. Thank you so much. And to the audience, if this is your favorite team, please do vote for the People's Choice Awards that is open throughout this whole show. So please go to slido.com, GDSC21 is the code, um, and vote for your favorite team. So thank you all so much. It was great learning more about your awesome project. Thanks. Bye, everyone. Thank you. Bye, y'all. Eric Al And now we have another finalist from India, Swasti is a medical app made to uplift user health and increase access to healthcare. It contains medicine reminder functionality and the ability to make an SOS call to a nearby ambulance, get an appointment with a virtual doctor, and more. Built with Flutter and Firebase, welcome the creators, Bhavesh, Himanshu, Ishan, and Kushal from Chitkala University in India. One in 10 patients in India die each day due to a delay in getting medical assistance. Which is surprising, because around 50,000 medical students graduate every year in India, which is the highest in the world. So we knew we had to do something. Introducing Swasti, the only health app you will ever need. To get started, simply sign in with the Google account, fill up a few fields, and that's it, you're in. Firstly, we build a symptom-based disease recognition system, where the users can type in the symptoms they are facing, and get a broader sense of what disease they might be going through. To get a surety, we added a doctor consultation platform where the patients can directly schedule appointments and have a call with doctors from across the world right within the app. 
they can pay the fee easily using Google Pay. And all the appointments are listed within the app from where they can get on a video call with the doctor. After the appointment, the doctor can give you a prescription which you can access at any time. On the basis of feedback from doctors and patients, we added a medicine reminder. Whenever you take a medicine on time, you will be awarded with hard points, which you can access by swiping left from your home screen. If a user opts to anonymously share their data from the disease recognition system, it will show heat maps based on disease spread in user's locality and can notify the user in case of any risk. We have also integrated discussion forums for the community, where people can share their thoughts and help those in need. Each time you help someone, you will be awarded with hard points. Lastly, in case of any emergency, a user can tap on the emergency button in our app and the nearest ambulance will be dispatched to user's location and along with that, the nearby medical volunteers will be notified. We really think this feature would help us save many lives. This project was made possible with the help of all these Google technologies. Oh, and you can also ask your Google Assistant for remedies. Here is a remedy you can try. Awesome. Hi, everyone. Good to see you. Hi, Victor. Great to Hi, see everyone. all of you. Hi. Great. So, Victor, do you want to introduce yourself? And I know that you have a couple questions for the team. Yes. Thanks, Erica. Hi, team. Hi, everyone. I'm Victor. I'm based out of the mountains of Colorado in the US, where I work remotely as an engineering and technical lead at the UNICEF Office of Innovation, where we look at technology innovation opportunities that exist at the intersection of multi-billion businesses, markets, and one billion person needs. And I only bring this up because this should definitely resonate with what you're building and your participation in the Google Solution Challenge. So I'm really impressed with what you have built, which is loaded with no shortage of functionality and features. We could easily call it hospital in a box, or rather the hospital inside your phone. Which brings me to my first question which is, given the variety of services that you integrate in your app and the work involved in setting the right partnerships for each, which one or two will you prioritize in the immediate future to maximize early adoption? Right, so every feature that you see in the app has been thoroughly thought before and made so that we can make our project product market fit. If I were to uh, list two features that would be the major attraction for early users, I would pick them on the basis of uh, usage and impact. So those two features, according to me, would be medicine reminder and doctor consultation. So the best part about Swasthe is that every feature complements the other, be it heat maps, discussion forms, or symptom-based disease uh, recognition. So this creates a, a seamless user experience. Obviously, the ultimate goal of our app is to reduce the number of deaths due to lack of the first response in India. So to tackle that, we'll partner up with public and private hospitals to create a network of ambulances that will leverage our SOS feature further, thus making uh, Swasthe the best in the segment. Makes perfect sense, and I really like um, hearing that you're putting impact first, and that's sort of your measure of of, of success and, and deciding where, where to go. Um, let me let me switch gears, and now for a more of a technical question, I'm curious to hear what parts of the Flutter platform made it easier for the app development process versus what parts of the platform didn't quite fit the needs of your app, and you had to write some custom code for it. Uh, I would like to tackle that one. Uh, let me just begin by saying that we love Flutter. And just to give you a little context on why, uh, see, the, most of the folks in our team, uh, we come from an Android and web background. And I know that as engineers, we should not use words like magic. But the first time that I used hot reload in Flutter, that's exactly what it felt like, pure magic. Uh, usually on Android, you have to go through this whole gradual build process just to see, uh, see your core changes uh, reflect in the app. And uh, in Flutter, like it's crazy fast, like uh, give or take two or three seconds. That's it. Plus, apart from that, of course, the cross-platform capabilities of Flutter, the ability to still you can still write and work native code using method channels. 
and uh, of course the dart language personally for me like it's it's kind of this perfect blend between the powerful uh, between the power of c sharp and the and still maintaining the flexibility of javascript and coming to some of the challenges that we faced in building swasti himanshu has a lot more to add on to that so over to you yeah sure so honestly speaking all the requirements of swasti were already met by flutter however we faced some limitation while adding specific features to it like uh, like integrating it with google assistant, uh, assistant action we use intent filters for voice actions and method channels to ask for the data but we cannot create our own voice action so we created a separate google assistant app for swasti itself another limitation was uh, how to create the heat maps for this we had to customize a particular plugin according to our use case and it did our work uh, also the gp plugin was not released at that moment so we had to rely on third party payment gateway services that supports google pay so these were some of the limitation that i can recall of right now that's that's great to hear i'm glad to hear that you um, figure out all your your way out through through this development phase um very quickly i'm really curious swasti really i really like the name it's like a hybrid of hindu and english is there any cool like one minute line story that you can tell us behind the name yeah it took us a couple of months to actually come up with a name like uh, initially we've called it project code red uh, because like mm. red is the color for health kind of that uh, mm. symbol but uh, later on like we wanted to uh, because like this solution is focused on india uh, our country and we wanted to resemble that somehow in the name itself so swasthi like swast uh, in hindi it means health so we just combined that and added an adjective like added a y because it sounds cool So uh, that's how we came up with the name Swasti. I love it. Very neat. Back to you, Erica. Great. Yeah, I was also curious about the name. So thanks for for sharing. So let's ask. Let's bring in the audience question. We have a question from DKG. Thank you for asking this. So how effective have the app trials been? Sure. Uh, yeah, we would love to tackle that. Okay, I would like to say like a product is of course only successful if the user chooses to use it, and that is why testing is one of the most crucial aspects of building any solution. And uh, to be very honest, like in these COVID times, it was a bit difficult for us to reach out to hospitals and other medical officers and patients. But still, we managed to uh, go out to this nearby uh, nursing home in Panchkula. It's a small town in India, and over there we reached out to the staff there regarding the problems they were facing. uh the medical staff and the inadequate uh, medical training opportunities that they receive while they are graduating while they are studying and along with that we also asked a couple of patients about the problems they have to face on day to day basis uh, to get medical assistance and some of the things that we received were and we also implemented were like first of all uh, patients on uh, normally uh, usually patients don't take medicines on time and maybe they uh, tend to forget that and uh, some even hide pay, uh, medicines from their caretakers for some reason so for that we added we integrated medicine reminder built into swasti and the second like most of the times patient don't know uh, what type of doctor or specialist to consult for a specific disease like most of the times uh, if uh, whenever you are going to any disease you just uh, visit your local uh, physician and uh, clinical doctor and uh, for that we added a symptom based disease information system and uh, of course in some rural areas uh, there's uh, there's a shortage like there's uh, not that much uh, and and not a lot of good doctors available in all the regions so that's why we added a doctor consultation feature also and these are all integrated within so like if you search for some diseases some symptoms on a uh, symptom based disease treatment system uh, you get recommended uh, hey this doctor might be good you can just book an appointment over there once you book an appointment then whatever prescription the doctor uh, gives you it's automatically added to your uh, medicine reminder and uh, you will get notified that's great uh I wanted yeah, to but, add something sure. in between. Uh, we successfully conducted the SOS trial with the help of Chandigarh Police, uh, where a person suffering from heart attack was to reach the hospital. But uh, with the help of our app, we notified the Chandigarh Police to sensitize the whole area and provide the green corridor to the patient to reach to the hospital soon. So we were able to save their life, and uh, that was the. first sos trial and it was successfully made so it was a great token of appreciation for us as we were able to save a life with that so it encouraged us to make some more features and integrate into our app wow that that's great thank you and victor did you have any final thoughts 
Yeah, that's awesome. Um, I wish you the best of luck. I think you're doing a great job. And I uh, I wanted to build on Babesh's last comment in that your your opening video starts with this um, stats on preventable deaths. And I'm really looking forward to crossing paths again in a couple of years where you say, well, before SWAT existed, these were the number of preventable deaths. Now we are here. And this is our work. So keep it up. Good luck. Good luck. Yeah, I would love to see that as well. We'll check back in in a couple of years. Join us for the demo day in the future. Awesome. Thank you so much for sharing more about your project and to the audience vote for this team if you're your favorite team. Thanks so much, everyone. Bye. Last but certainly not least, a huge welcome to the Simple AR team. Simple AR is an app that utilizes the power of natural language processing to translate any text into a simplified language, only by taking a picture of it. Flutter and Firebase were the main ingredients used to develop Simple AR. Let's please give a warm, warm welcome to the creators, Almo, Maria, Sami, and Viviana, from the Technical University of Munich in Germany. The concept of functional literacy is based on the UNESCO definitions, which cover a continuum of proficiency levels rather than a dichotomy. You didn't understand the meaning of the sentence? Functional illiteracy, the inability to understand text on more than a basic level, is the reality for one in seven people worldwide. Among others, one common cause is intellectual disabilities. In a world where we communicate mainly through text, People with functional illiteracy are excluded in many ways. UN Goal 10.3 specifically states to empower and promote inclusion of all, including people with disabilities. When talking to experts, we learned that there are simplified language frameworks that help with functional illiteracy. However, these texts are translated by hand, so only very few texts are made accessible. This is where Simple AR comes in. We are using the power of natural language processing to automatically translate any text for functional illiterate people. When first opening the app, the user is introduced into the W3C verified disability friendly UI. In our Flutter app, the user can scan any text. Firebase ML extracts the text and sends it to our backend hosted by Google Cloud. The backend uses a mix of GPT-3 and our own machine learning models to process the text into a simpler version. The simplified text is returned to the client, which then shows it as an AR overlay. Some texts are so complicated that an AR overlay would be unreadable. In this case, we open a new screen with the plain language text and supporting images, as recommended by the plain language framework. Using Simple AR, functional literate people can understand any text in any medium independently. And we can have a more inclusive world. Hi, hi again, Victor. Hi, Team Simple AR. So good to see you. Dialing in from Germany. That's great. Um, Victor, do you want to introduce yourself again? And I know that you have a couple questions for this team. Thanks, Erika. Hi, Tim. Hi, everyone. I'm Victor. I'm based out of the mountains of Colorado here in the US, where I work remotely as engineering and technical lead at the UNICEF Office of Innovation, where we are constantly exploring and prototyping frontier technologies for the benefit of every child everywhere to build a better world for everyone. And I only bring this up because I think that this should resonate with your participation in this year's solution challenge and the, the amazing application that you have built to help um, people with um, disabilities in, in understanding text, which is a, a very, I, I find a very hard problem. So I'm glad that uh, we have this uh, very capable team tackling it. I, I can, this, this question all the judges have asked to other teams, but I feel really compelled to understand this, so I'll ask it again. What was the biggest challenge you faced while building your solution and, you know, give some, put some color on how did you overcome it? Um, so, yeah, let me start with the question. So, actually, the biggest uh, challenge of our project was the text simplification itself. Like you already said, it's a really difficult task. 
So it may seem maybe at the beginning that it is really simple just to take a text and just to write a simple version of it so that, for example, a two years old child can understand what DNA is or something like that. But for technology, it's like really, really hard. So, and this is because this problem of text simplification is currently one of the most, or like one of the research topics in natural language processing. And there are only a few data sets uh, to use to train a machine learning algorithm on so that it really can give uh, good results at the end. Um, so yeah, and especially in German. And also there are a lot of different possibilities on how to approach this problem. And so like, what, what we did is we collaborated with many experts in natural language processing. So for example, professors or PhD students. And what we did is we evaluated the state of the art methods for text simplification. But what we noticed is that they had their own strengths and weaknesses in different domains. So to improve the stability of our models, we combined multiple machine learning methods, including GPT-3, for example, and we created our own pipeline, which adds additional pre and post processing to the text. That's great. And thanks for mentioning uh, or the mention on GPT-3. I just want to make a quick uh, comment to the audience. If you are not aware of this, it's a natural language processing model that is trained on 100 plus billion parameters. So when we talk about complexity, this is, this is the real deal. Um, switching gears, in the demo that we have just seen, the second example simplifies um, legal text for easier understanding. I think <laughs> something that we could all benefit from. And then, but but it has it, it concerns me because it has some implications on the the legal implications of handling legal text and the liability of, of such. So you know, what if some important detail is lost and causes the wrong action or or inaction that negatively affects the individual that is reading the simplified version? Can can you comment on on that, please? Yeah, thank you very much for the question. Um, first of all, we want uh, to clarify that Simple AR is not aiming to provide uh, legal advice. Um, instead, we are giving these people um, an opportunity to be more informed um, about what's happening around them. Our main use cases are everyday interactions like uh, reading newspapers, uh, restaurant menus, or for example, emails. But what we did learn in our expert interviews is that, um, for example, people with more severe cases of cognitive disabilities have an assistant to help them with legal matters, and we are not aiming to replace these assistants. Um, but these assistants cannot always be there all the time. So we are closing this gap between everyday life tasks and the tasks where an assistant can help them. Got it. Thank you for that uh, clarification. Much, much better now. Back to you, Erica, for the, the question from the audience. Yeah, sounds good. We got some questions. Um, so the question for all of you is, um, what makes this application different or unique from other translation apps? Sure. So I can start with the, with the answer. So uh, what our app does is it doesn't translate, for example, from English to German, for example. What it does, it, it simplifies the language. So for example, if there's a, like a really complex sentence, like for example, from Wikipedia, and um, there are many people who can't understand this, especially people with disabilities. So uh, what we do is we make these texts more accessible for those people by simplifying these words, for example, using different techniques, for example, um, lexical, lexical simplification by re replacing difficult words, or for example, restructuring the sentences into shorter sentences, making them all more simple, and also providing a really intuitive UI, uh, providing more images for them. So what we do is we make text more accessible for people. Yeah, and I also want to add that um, we also mainly focus on texts in physical form, not in internet form, but like in physical form, like um, some of us already mentioned, for example, newspaper, or if you get a letter from some, I don't know, insurance company or something, like we get it a lot in Germany. So um, it's pretty easy to just, you know, take the text, type it down somewhere in Google and simplify it to a simpler version. So with our app, you can just take a photo and you get the simplified text on screen or like with photos like Alma already mentioned. That's great. Thank you. Um, Victor, did you have any final comments? 
Yeah, just building on what Maria said, I think that we get letters from the insurance companies everywhere in the world, unfortunately, and they are never good news. <laughs> so I think we could all get some help with those. Um, thank you very much for tackling this problem. Uh, jokes aside, I think it is a very uh, important problem that has been unaddressed for a long time. So I'm glad that you are tackling it now. Um, best of luck. Thanks so much. And to the audience, if this was your favorite team, you all have about two more minutes left to vote. So please do vote um, for Simple AR or any team that's your favorite right now at Slido.com. And we all know the code is GDSC21. So thank you so much, uh, Simple AR team. So good to learn more about your project. And thank you, Victor. Good to see you. Good to see you too. Bye, everyone. Bye. Great. So thank you all so much for sticking with us for the last couple of hours. We do still have announcements, so do not leave the live stream yet. We haven't heard yet who the top three winners are, the People's Choice Award, so get ready. Um, but first, what did you all think about the demos? Add in the chat. Let us know what you thought. Um, I, I loved these demos. It was so cool to see the different bits of technology they use, the different types of uh, uh, UN sustainable development goals they solve for, really inspiring. Um, and I'm wondering if you're thinking about what projects you're going to work on next year for the Solution Challenge. A uh, quick plug is that we will launch it again in January of next year. So I'm excited to see what you all demo next year. Um, so right now is the last opportunity to vote for the People's Choice Award. This is your last chance uh, to vote for your favorite team. So please do that right now. You have two minutes, two minutes left. Message your friends and say, hey, it's time to vote for our favorite team. Um, which team resonated with you? Is there a, a project that inspired you? Maybe you live in the same country as the folks on this team. Whatever your reasoning is, vote for your favorite. You have two minutes left and you go to slido.com, enter the code GDSC21, or you can scan the following QR code and, and vote right now. So you have two minutes, you're on the clock. And what are we going to do in the next two minutes? Um, I'll share that right now. So before we announce the People's Choice Award and the top three winners, um, we wanted to share a few tips and best practices from the students that you've heard from today on how to develop solutions. So I hope that you it will help you as you work on your projects, hopefully for the Solution Challenge next year. Um, but these are some great tips. So let's play that video. Let's check out the tips. My best tip is don't get overwhelmed by the amount of work. Just start working on your project and see how the steps unravel. So my advice for student developers is to stay curious and to stay open. Often there are multiple ways leading to a result. You just gotta stay curious enough to learn about them. We should always look for problems to solve in our community. And we should never be afraid to make mistakes because it is from these mistakes that we make that we learn. Please make sure that you have already spoken with the people from your target group and make sure that the people really need your idea. Remember that when you get stuck, it means that you're going through uncharted territories and that's when the learning happens. Be patient and have fun. My advice is to have trust in yourself, trust in your team, trust in your mentor and also trust the process. As a developer, remember performing a tech equivalent of CPR whenever the program crashes. It's called CDR. Code, decode, pre code. To all developers out there, don't underestimate yourself and your dreams. People are almost always willing to share. So try and understand their pain points and use technology to build solutions which will help them. Once you have an idea you believe in, you're already halfway there. Embrace diversity, especially in your backgrounds, and you are sure to come up with some great ideas. Time management is very essential, so try to plan, manage, and organize your time properly. Do not be afraid when you encounter steep learning curves while programming. The internet has an amazing community of people always willing to help. Remember that you always have a role to play. Choose a team that complements and empowers your skills. Our biggest weakness lies in giving up. When facing an issue or a bug, the most certain way to succeed is to just try that one more time. Try to focus on one problem at a time. Do the most important task first, and of course, don't forget to have fun. Observe your environment for solution ideas, and most importantly, don't be lazy or hesitant to start or continue the project. You will never know unless you try. So go ahead and try out your brilliant idea.
those are great tips. I agree. Do not underestimate yourself, get to know the users and definitely have fun. Um, so now we're going to announce the People's Choice Award. I do not know which team has won yet, so I'm on the edge of my seat just like you. I'm going to see it on the slide. But first, I want to mention that we had over 2,000 of you voted. So thank you so much. Again, I have no idea which team this is going to be, but I'm excited. So with that, let's announce the People's Choice Award winner. Awesome. Congratulations, Team EL from Egypt. Great work. You had tons of votes. Um, wonderful. And I'm so happy that a lot of folks are here to cheer you on. And great work. You are the People's Choice Award winner for the 2021 Solution Challenge Demo Day. So great work, Team EL. Loved your project. And next up, we have a special... Uh, honorary mention. Um, this is something we're doing uh, a bit differently this year, and um, we are going to be announcing that in just a minute. Um, and then we are going to share with you who the top three winners are. So definitely stick with us, message your friends on WhatsApp, Discord, on social, email. If people are still using email, I'm just kidding, but definitely tell your friends. Join us to hear the top three winning teams. You have about 30 seconds. While you do that, I do want to mention the honorable mention. We, we, after The judges were awesome. They did take a few weeks to review all the projects, score them. They listened today, and they did want to have a, a special call out to a team that was really focused on the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals and did a really good job with impact. So we do want to call out this team. So the team with honorable mention is Team Flow from Cameroon. Great work. We loved your project. Very important topic of helping people fly, find clean water. So great work. We really loved what you did and how you solved for this UN Sustainable Development Goal. So kudos to you. Thank you so much. You are the honorable mention for the 2021 Solution Challenge. Thanks so much. And next up, we are finally going to announce the top three winners. I am not going to keep you here any longer. I want to get straight to it. So thank you so much to the judges for going through impact and technology, diving deep into each of the top 10 teams. Um, so the final three winners of the Google Developer Student Club's 2021 Solution Challenge are the first team is Dementi Care from Singapore. Great work, Dementi Care. We love this project, wonderful work, important topic. And I know that you're already talking to organizations, so keep up the good work. Thanks so much. You're one of the top three winners. Thank you, Dementi Care. Now let's move on to the next team, number two. Who do you think it's going to be? Do you want to mention in the chat? There it is. It's Eye of God from India. Great work. You worked on this awesome IoT project, really pulled in um, some good technology, and, and you did a great job with this. So I have God from India. Great work on this project. You are one of the three Solution Challenge Demo Day winners. So wonderful work. And lastly, but not least, we have the third of the three winning teams. And who do you think it's going to be? Let's check it out. It's iRise from the Philippines. They had matching shirts today. You might have, you might remember them. Um, great work to iRise. We really like this project as well. Um, definitely solving for the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. Great work on impact and technology. So great work to Team iRise. Great work to Dementi Care, and also I have God. All three of you are the winning teams. Congratulations! Um, and along with mentoring. Uh, with Googlers and Schwag, the each student from all of these teams is going to be winning a Chromebook and also a meet and greet with an executive. Um, so once again, I just wanted to say great job to all the 10 finalists. We loved all of your projects. And congrats again to Dementi Care, I have God, and also iRise. Great work, everybody. So lastly, we just wanted to uh, close out today. It's been a couple of hours. Thank you for sticking with us. And um, I know people were dialing in from all over the world, a lot of people from Egypt, India, um, and all over basically. So thank you so much for sticking with us. Um, thank you to everybody who took part in the 2021 Solution Challenge 
you worked on your projects in uh, from January to March and longer. Um, we had over 800 projects, all very inspiring, and you were solving for the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. So great work to all of you. And thank you to you, everyone who's here right now, live with us, watching. Thank you for cheering on all of these teams, for being active, for asking questions, for saying hello in the chat. Um, we appreciate all of you. Thank you so much. Um, and now a, a few final comments. I just wanted to remind you all to claim your Google Developers badge. I did that uh, already in between the breaks. So I, I'm set, but are you? Definitely grab your badge. Um, and next, we do love feedback. We do. What did you think about the event today? Did you like it? Did you dislike it? It's okay. Feedback is a gift, as they say, even when it's tough, it's helpful. Um, so definitely let us know what you thought about this. Should we do it again next year? Um, let us know. And lastly, if you want to learn more about GDSC, also known as Google Developer Student Clubs, please do go to this link, um, goo.gle forward slash GDSC, and, and think about starting a Google Developer Student Club on your university campus or joining one or just supporting us on, on social and great work to everybody today. Thank you so much for joining us. That's it from us. I hope that the Solution Challenge has inspired you all as much as it's inspired me um, to continue to think about how we use technology for good. So I hope to see you all here next year. Thank you all so much for joining. Bye, everyone.